What's going on, everybody? Good Mike War Commentaries back at you with episode 514. This podcast is going to be very much like last week. I'm finding myself in the same position that I was in last week, and that is when I take a look back at Monday Night Raw and SmackDown Live, I really wasn't sure if there was enough going on to really fill a full episode. But considering a couple of things that we saw on Raw and SmackDown, specifically the Shawn Michaels and Undertaker promo, and a few other things as well, I figured, what the hell, yeah, definitely, let's come up here and do a regular episode, despite the the fact that I am super duper busy this week. I've got all sorts of stuff going on at work. I've got a last minute, extremely late at the buzzer fantasy football draft that my friends and I are throwing together. I was going to sit out this year. I didn't really feel like doing fantasy football. I was kind of over it. So I kind of let everybody know that I didn't want to do it. But three or four other people had the same idea. So a bunch of people dropped out. We found replacements for everybody except for one spot. So I didn't want to leave everybody hanging. So I said, fine, fuck it, I'll do it, count me in, maybe I'll get lucky and I can sit out next year or something like that. So I've got that going on. I've also got my birthday this week and uh, coming up this Tuesday on September 11th, you're going to have a brand new video hitting the channel as well that I'm also working on. That's one of those $100 PayPal donation videos that's courtesy of Barry uh, this time around. So that video will be hitting the channel this coming Tuesday. Speaking of other videos, for those of you who might not know, this past weekend we had the big all-in pay-per-view. Uh, from Chicago that Cody and the Bucks put on. Most people are aware that that show took place, and most of you, I'm sure, do know the results, and the show was a huge success. I did do a review on that in a one-off episode a couple of days ago. I wasn't able to watch the show live. I didn't even get a review up on it until, like, early Monday morning, but the video is on my channel, and I will throw a link up in the top right-hand corner there if you want to check out my all-in review. As far as this episode goes, like I said, I'm just going to briefly touch on Raw and SmackDown, not even going to go through the whole shows, just going to talk about the major angles and the key stuff that took place heading into Hell in the Cell. I'll get into all of the teams for the Mixed Match Challenge, and then we will preview the entire Hell in the Cell card, including the matches that are announced and the matches that will likely be announced. And that's really all you're going to get out of me this week. After that, just keep an eye on the channel this week. You might see a few mic drops hitting the channel. And then, of course, I'll be up here this coming Monday Night Live for my Monday Night Raw watch along. And then, of course, on Tuesday the 11th, you'll have a brand new special episode hitting the channel as well. So let's jump in here and get into what we're going to talk about today. And I want to start with Monday Night Raw. Now, a lot of you were with me this week. We had a really good audience for my Monday Night Raw watch along this week. So a lot of you got to watch this big Undertaker and Shawn Michaels promo with me. And you saw that I got faked out. I really did not think The Undertaker was going to be there. For some reason, I'm having a really hard time accepting the fact that WWE is making this Undertaker and Triple H match in Australia a huge deal. I don't understand it. I haven't. I've been baffled by it since the beginning, since the very first announcement of this match. And I've said it time and time again, when this match was first announced, the very first thing that came into my head was the John Cena and Triple H match from the Greatest Royal Rumble a few months ago. I just thought this was going to be a match to give to the Australian audience. They don't get a lot of WWE programming. They're all by themselves on their giant fucking island continent down there in the corner of the world. And they don't get stuff like this. And they have a beautiful stadium there. The WWE can really make this thing like a WrestleMania type of feel. And I thought that the Undertaker and Triple H match was simply an attraction to give the fans a thrill. It's going to be more about seeing the stars, seeing their entrances, seeing them in person than the actual match in the ring. And I certainly didn't think there would be any storyline attached to this match. But holy shit, is WWE going all in with this thing? No pun intended. And it's even looking like this could potentially be your main event. Triple H and John Cena, I believe, opened the show at the Greatest Royal Rumble. Taker and Triple H might close the show here. So we already had a very long Triple H promo hyping up the match that I was very bad by. I'm like, who fucking cares? They got all the time in the world to promote this stuff. Why don't we worry about promoting Hell in the Cell and get on the other side of that pay-per-view before we worry about this shit? But WWE is... Uh really trying to make this thing a big deal. So you had the big, long Triple H promo explaining himself as to why he's facing The Undertaker. They did acknowledge the fact that these two guys did have a quote-unquote end-of-an-era match back in 2012. Six and a half years ago, these two men supposedly wrestled for the last time. So when they announced this match, that had a lot of us saying, okay, what the fuck? You know, WWE, do you ever follow through with any of these big taglines for these matches? Once in a lifetime, end of an era, get the fuck out of here with this shit. So we were already kind of like, okay, what's going on? So Triple H cuts the big promo to say, basically give his reasons as to why he's facing him again. We then go to very long video 
video packages on Raw and on SmackDown and all over WWE social media, hyping this big epic confrontation between these two legends. And make no mistake about it, they are legends. And then we also had a bunch of interviews with current and former WWE talent predicting winners for this match. So they're really treating it as if it's some sort of a big WrestleMania type main event. And to me, I just found that odd because what are we going to see physically out of these two guys in the ring? We're not going to see jack shit. I personally don't have a whole lot of interest in seeing these two guys in the ring in 2018. I just don't think the match is going to be very good, uh, much like the uh, Triple H Cena match at Greatest Royal Rumble. What did they do? Go back and watch that match. They barely even touched each other. They simply went through the motions and were very careful and very protected, and that's really all I thought we were going to get out of The Undertaker and Triple H in Australia. But considering how much they're hyping this match up, maybe this is some sort of a big deal. And then it took an even bigger turn this past week on Monday Night Raw when Shawn Michaels was advertised for the show to cut a promo hyping up the match between Triple H and The Undertaker. And that's really all I thought that was going to be. Now, don't get me wrong. It's always great to see Shawn Michaels. I haven't seen him come out in a WWE ring since his haircut. So I liked seeing him out there. It's great to hear the sexy boy music and see Shawn. Even at his age, whatever he is now, 50 or whatever he is, he is just still in amazing shape. And all I really thought he was going to do is come out there and cut a promo on his history with Triple H and The Undertaker. Nobody knows these two guys better than him, right? He was the referee during that end of an era Hell in the Cell match that they had six and a half years ago. And The Undertaker also retired Shawn Michaels back at uh, WrestleMania 26, correct? So there was a lot going on there with Shawn. He probably was the perfect guy to insert into the middle of this thing, but I really thought he was just out there to cut a promo similar to what Triple H did the week before, the week before that, whenever that was. Um, But then, as Shawn Michaels is talking, the lights go out, and we hear the gong. And I'm thinking to myself, you guys were with me on Monday night. I'm watching this live on the stream, and I'm saying to myself, the Undertaker's not there. He's not going to come out there. This is going to be some spooky-ass you know, trick or mind game. He's going to come up on the Tron. We're just going to get lightning and thunder and maybe a message from The Undertaker. He's not really going to come out there. Considering how shitty Raw's ratings have been lately, you would think if The Undertaker was going to be on the show, they might promote it or advertise it, but they didn't. So the whole time his music is playing, I'm not convinced that he's coming out there. And then he appears, comes right through the fucking curtain and starts walking down the aisle to get in the ring. And I'm like, holy shit, This just got a little bit more interesting. Here we have Shawn Michaels and The Undertaker in the same ring on Monday Night Raw in 2018. So how many more chances are we going to get to even see something like this? So again, I just thought it was going to be more just meaningless promo. Undertaker was just going to say a few words about his history with Triple H and Shawn, and then that was going to be the end of it. But no, the two guys got personal. And uh, Shawn Michaels, what I like the most about this is that he called The Undertaker out. And I think somebody finally needed to call The Undertaker out for this retirement bullshit. And Shawn Michaels, you know, he he looks at himself. He says, hey, when you retired me eight and a half years ago, back in 2010, I stayed retired. No matter how many offers I had to come out of retirement, the millions, literally millions of dollars that I turned away. I didn't come back to the ring out of respect, not only for the business and the fans, but out of respect for you. You're the one that ended my career, and if I came back, that would be a slap in your face. Meanwhile, your big dead ass goes out there to face WWE's poster boy in the main event of WrestleMania when a title is not even on the line. This is a company with two world titles, and they give the main event to a non-title match because they think it's going to be The Undertaker's retirement. He loses to Roman Reigns, takes off his hat, his jacket, and his gloves, symbolically lays them down in the ring, and then leaves. Now, yes, I understand he didn't really come out and say he was retiring, but that was the message they were delivering. I don't care what anybody says. He retired in that match with Roman Reigns, and then what happened? One year later, he's back in the ring at the very same event, wrestling John Cena. What the fuck? So the fact that Shawn Michaels called him out for that... I appreciate it because nobody loves The Undertaker or his career more than I do, but it is really hard to see Undertaker turning into the type of wrestler that I used to criticize 20 years ago. Guys like Hogan, guys like Flair, guys like Savage, and a few others had that reputation in the 90s of not being able to hang it up, not being able to let go, taking up a spot, holding others down, shit like that. That was uh, that was the stigma that was attached to all of them, and guess what? All of those guys at the time were a lot younger than The Undertaker currently is right now. 
So the fact that he is still in there year after year, even seemingly retiring and then still coming back to wrestle more is starting to make it look like he's the legend that can't let go. He's the greedy one. And I appreciate it. Shawn Michaels calling him out for that. Now, the bigger story here, I think, in this promo between the two of them is that you kind of forgot all about Triple H. This match is actually not between The Undertaker and Shawn Michaels. It's between The Undertaker and Triple H. And considering Undertaker has won all of their previous encounters, he's beat them all three times at WrestleMania, you got to think that maybe Triple H is going to score the win here, especially if Shawn Michaels gets involved. They might wind up making Shawn Michaels the referee again. You never know. Something tells me he's going to be in Australia for this match. So if he's advertised or he has an actual, he plays a role in this match, I don't know, or if it's a run-in type of thing. But right now, I'm I'm starting to think that maybe Triple H gets the victory here because is it just me or does it seem like the WWE is actually teasing a return to the ring by Shawn Michaels here? Something tells me they are. They've gone out of their way to talk about the end of an era match. They've gone out of their way to acknowledge the fact that The Undertaker retired and then came back and Shawn Michaels stayed true to his word. He truly is the only wrestler Aside from being forced into retirement by injury, a guy like Stone Cold, a guy like Edge, and a few others, you know, aside from some sort of uh, debilitating injury, Shawn Michaels is the only guy to stay retired who has still been capable of wrestling beyond his years. And now it's starting to look like maybe, just maybe, he might get back in the ring. We thought we were really close to it a couple of years ago with Shawn Michaels and AJ Styles. The rumors were really heavy around that time. And now, considering what Shawn Michaels and Undertaker said to each other in this promo, do you think that Shawn Michaels might come back for one more match? Do you think he interferes in the Undertaker and Triple H match, costing the Undertaker the match against Hunter in Australia, setting up a Shawn Michaels versus the Undertaker match? And here's an even crazier thought. And I mentioned this in my live stream on Monday as well. What if they had another Undertaker and Shawn Michaels match? Let's say, for example, at the Survivor Series, where The Undertaker debuted, an event that I will be at live this year in L.A. in November. I'm going to be there. What if Shawn Michaels faces The Undertaker in a retirement match? What if The Undertaker puts his career on the line against Shawn Michaels and Shawn Michaels beats him? I think it'll be the only time in history that two guys retired each other. Sean comes back for one more match to retire The Undertaker. If Shawn Michaels is going to come back for any type of match, that would be the one I think that would salvage the respect, quote unquote, you know, for, you know, coming out of retirement when somebody else retired you. If he comes back to face the same guy, then, you know, it doesn't really ruin anything technically. Although if Shawn Michaels did come back, I would like to see him in the ring with somebody like AJ Styles or a lot of different opponents aside from The Undertaker. But maybe The Undertaker is the guy that uh, WWE has penciled in here. Now, my retirement match idea probably won't happen because I have a really hard time believing that The Undertaker will not wrestle at this coming WrestleMania, WrestleMania 35 in New York. I'm pretty sure the way they set the whole thing up last year that Undertaker is probably penciled in to face John Cena this year again at WrestleMania. So if he retires at Survivor Series, that that match can't happen, and uh, if Shawn Michaels does return to the ring, that means maybe Shawn doesn't work with Taker and he works with somebody else. But here's the thing. You know, a lot of people ask me during the live stream. They've asked me on Twitter. They've asked me all week. Number one, do you think Shawn Michaels is going to come back to the ring? And number two, do you want him to return to the ring? Now, the first question is, I don't know. I don't know if he's coming back for a match or not, but the way WWE set everything up on Monday, maybe. I think it's possible. And the second part of that question is, I got to give an honest no. I just don't have any desire. I'm lucky. I'm in my 40s. I watched Shawn Michaels wrestle since he was a little kid with baby fat all over him, okay? I got to take in Shawn Michaels' entire career. I got to see him through every phase of his wrestling career, every place he worked, every place he won a title, you know, all the different chapters in his life, in his career, and his injuries, and his world titles, and his moments, and his trials and tribulations, and his ups and downs. I got to take in the entire Shawn Michaels experience, and I still, to this day, don't think there has ever been anybody better inside a wrestling ring. And for me, I just don't have a desire. I don't want Shawn Michaels to come back. Now, Shawn is one guy 
that I believe that at 85 years old could probably still have a good match. So I'm not really doubting Shawn Michaels' ability in the ring. I think if he were to come back to have one more match, he would be fantastic. He would he would at least be fantastic for his age, let's say that. But still, even despite all of that, I don't need it. As a wrestling fan, it's not something that my heart needs or desires or wants. I'm perfectly happy remembering Shawn Michaels for the career that he had. I don't need another match. You know, every time at the Hall of Fame, whenever somebody does a speech or a legend comes back, the fans are always chanting, one more match, one more match. Not me. I don't want to see him have one more match. I have no reason to. Uh, So I don't know if Shawn Michaels has just been getting the itch. He's been working at the Performance Center. He's probably been bouncing around the ring a little bit. And he probably realizes that, you know what? I could probably come back for one more match and one more big payday. So if this is it for Shawn, I'm not going to... I, I mentioned this earlier about the Triple H Undertaker match. Even though I have my issues with it and I don't really want to see it, I'm going to tolerate it out of respect for The Undertaker and Triple H. And Shawn Michaels, same thing. If he does come back to the ring, even though in my heart of hearts, I don't really want to see it happen, if Shawn Michaels chooses to make that decision and WWE brings him back, I will support him 1 million percent. Absolutely. Um, But it's just something that me as a fan, I don't need to see. So I want to hear what you guys think. Uh, Does this look like this is a tease of Shawn Michaels actually getting back in the ring? Or is it just a way to build hype for the Triple H and Undertaker match? But... You know, if you do the finish with Triple H winning, it can set up other things in the future, and who knows where the hell you can go uh, heading into next year. So this Shawn Michaels promo seems like to be a little bit more than it seems like on the surface, and we might actually see the Heartbreak Kid back in the ring in his 50s with short hair and a Google eye. So that was probably the biggest news to come out of Monday Night Raw, but it certainly wasn't the only news to come out of Monday Night Raw. We had a lot going on involving The Shield and Braun Strowman's heel turn from a week ago, joining forces with Dolph Ziggler, Andrew McIntyre. They furthered that this week on Raw. The three of them actually opened up the show and uh, they're out there cutting a promo. The Shield then tries to interrupt. Uh, They come out, they come down through the crowd and try to get in the ring to face off with uh, their rivals when the entire locker room empties out. Baron Corbin or Constable Corbin, GM Corbin, whatever the fuck, sends the entire roster out to head off the two factions and try to break them up, and it was this big pull-apart, and the Shield is trying to get at Strowman and Dolph and Drew, and they get to him a couple of times, and finally the whole thing ends with everybody being pulled apart and being drugged back to the backstage area, where the Shield winds up getting arrested. Baron Corbin has them arrested. So uh, 35 wrestlers on the roster couldn't restrain the shield, but four cops, one of which appeared to be a woman, was able to put handcuffs on all three of them. So I don't know how that really exactly works. But they had all three S.H.I.E.L.D. members handcuffed and all sitting in a little van together. And there was something about, you guys who saw me uh, on Monday night and were with me watching on live stream, I was laughing. There was something about that image of the three S.H.I.E.L.D. guys sitting in the back of that paddy wagon handcuffed and just sitting in the little chairs. I don't know why I was laughing so hard about that, but I was. It also didn't make any sense at all, because why are these three guys being arrested for showing up to work? That's all they did, but I guess that's the type of shit that happens when you have a heel GM. So Balor has them all arrested, or I'm sorry, Corbin has them all arrested, and the shield is driven away and hauled off to jail. Now, the fact that this all happened in the opening segment was a pretty firm spoiler that we were going to see these guys later on in the show, most likely in the main event. And it was funny, too, throughout the show, uh, Corey Graves or somebody was giving them giving them up Updates, giving the fans updates on what's going on at the jail. They're being fingerprinted and they're being processed and they're posting bail and all this bullshit. So it was fucking ridiculous. Um, they weren't done, though, with all six of these guys because WWE decided to add a little bit more uh, to this feud. And they run an angle where we're supposed to have a tag team title match between the B team and the Revival. The Revival are backstage And I think Dolph and Drew are cutting a promo or something like that, and they're threatening to fuck something up or whatever, and they end up walking away, running into the Revival, beating the shit out of the Revival backstage, and the Revival is unable to now go compete in their tag team title match. So what do they do? They insert Dolph and Drew in their place. So Dolph Ziggler and Drew McIntyre take on the B-team for the titles. And again, I guess that's why they got Kurt Angle out of there, because there's no way this would fly on Kurt's watch. So I guess Corbin has no issue with this. Uh, Dolph and Drew just beating the hell out of the Revival like that and going into the ring to face the B-team for the tag team titles. How crazy is that? And as soon as that match happened, I was thinking to myself, they're going to win. I said it right from the beginning on the live stream, the whole entire match. I said, Dolph and Drew are going to win the belts here. There's no way they're not going to win the titles because WWE wouldn't do this match match 
if they weren't going to put the belts on him. So there was no reason for Dolphin Drew to go out there and face the B team and somehow get screwed and lose their chance to win the titles. They were going to win the titles here. And I think the whole reason for that is just to give that faction a couple of belts. You got two belts over on the Shield side. Now you got two belts over on Dolph, Drew, and Strowman's side. And I will guarantee you that I think Ambrose and Seth will wind up challenging and probably defeating Dolph and Drew for those tag team titles at some point. And I would also like to see the B team regain them. I think in the next few weeks on Storyline, the B team might find a way to win those belts back with some interference from the Shield or something like that because I was all about the B team's tag team title run. I thought they should have a little bit of a run with it. I wasn't really ready to see them drop it to like a regular tag team, but the fact that they dropped them to Dolph and Drew, I'm okay with because it adds more, you know, prestige. It adds more gold. It adds more championships to this big feud between these two factions. So for the for immediate purposes, I'm fine with this. I don't really have a problem with the title change. I don't think it was stupid. I don't think it didn't make any sense or anything like that. This was purely done to give that feud some more belts. I think the B team can regain them sometime in the future, and it would be cool if they get a rematch because they're going to get one with the rematch clause in the next couple of weeks, and the shield costs Dolphin Drew the match, and the B team wind up winning the belts back, which serves a couple of purposes there. Number one, it... Uh, adds to the storyline between the Shield, Dolph, Drew, and Strowman, and it gives the B team a big victory. You know, they're going to go down in the record books now as defeating a pretty impressive tag team for the titles. They they, they beat a couple of main eventers. So if we've uh, seen what their celebrations have been like before, when they win the belts back, it might be even bigger. Uh, But I also wouldn't be surprised, like I said, for the Shield to regain the belts as well. Maybe Dolph and Drew and the Shield trade the belts back and forth, and then sometime in the next few weeks or couple of months, the B team is able to get them back. That's my guess there. Uh, But really, I had no issue with Dolph and Drew winning the titles. And if you're going to put them in the ring in a tag team championship match against two guys like Bo Dallas and Curtis Axel, they better goddamn fucking win. And they did. And they're your new tag team champions. So good for them. Congrats to Dolph and Drew. And uh, we continue getting all of this shield updates throughout the course of the night. And the main event turned out to be Braun Strowman versus Finn Balor. It was supposed to be Finn Balor versus Corbin. But then Corbin changed it, so they're still not done with this Balor-Corbin feud. I'm assuming they're going to announce some sort of a match at Hell in the Cell. Baron Corbin is still scared shitless of the demon for some reason, still scared of a fucking Halloween costume. He refuses, absolutely refuses, uh, to get in the ring with the demon again. And so the writing was on the wall at that point. You knew we were going to see the Shield show up in that match, and you have the match between Braun Strowman and Balor in the main event. Strowman winds up beating Balor, not surprisingly, and that's when the Shield returns. They return in the same van that they were driven away in. So we hear the big siren first, and every time we hear that, we're thinking Scott Steiner's coming out. So uh, they back in the police van while the siren's going off. They back it in uh, right up to the ramp. You know, these guys couldn't take an Uber. Uh, they had to drive the exact same. I guess they stole the police van. So they got arrested for showing up to work earlier on in the night, but yet they're free and clear uh, after a little uh, Grand Theft Auto. So they bring back the police van, drive it right into the arena. They jump out. They go to attack Braun Strowman, Drew McIntyre, and Dolph Ziggler. And that's when the entire heel locker room show up. Now, unlike the opening segment where the where baby faces and heels were trying to pull everybody apart, this was pretty much only heels this time, and they all showed up there seemingly at the request or at the demand or command, I should say, of Baron Corbin, and they completely annihilate the shield. 25 guys just bum rush and destroy Seth Rollins, Dean Ambrose, and Braun Strowman. And Seth Rollins especially, he took a really gnarly bump right into the side of the police van, and the side window broke. And later on, when Seth was being beaten down near the ring, you saw blood all over his arm. So it looked like he got sliced and diced up pretty bad. I hope he's okay. I don't know if it required stitches. I have not even read any sort of an injury report on Seth Rollins, but uh, he definitely got hurt in that one. And uh, that's two weeks in a row now that the Shield has been completely decimated, completely annihilated, which means next week on the Go Home Show, they're going to have to get some payback here. They're going to have to wind up kicking these guys' ass. They might wind up costing Dolph and Drew the tag team titles at some point. I don't know if that'll really happen next week, but you would think it's going to happen at some point between the two. So I would think that considering 
considering the Shield just reunited and they've been getting their asses kicked ever since they reunited, they are due for a good week here. And uh, maybe next week on the Go Home Show, they will be the ones getting the upper hand. Now, we don't have anything advertised between these two teams except for the Braun Strowman and Roman Reigns Hell in the Cell title match that'll probably be the main event at the pay-per-view. So aside from that, I don't know. I'm guessing because Seth Rollins really doesn't have an intercontinental title program going right now with anybody. If I had to guess, Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose might wind up challenging Dolph and Drew for the tag team titles at Hell in the Cell. And what if they win them? You know, then the Shield's got all the belts. Every belt is going to be on the Shield. So I'm wondering if they're going to announce that match or maybe if the B team gets a shot at Hell in the Cell instead or maybe they get the B team's title shot or rematch out of the way on Raw so they can move on to Seth and Dean against Dolph and Drew. I'm not really sure. But you would think that's probably going to be a match we're going to get at the pay-per-view um hell it might even be a three-way maybe it's a triple threat with the b team involved too i don't know who knows what the hell they're going to do but it would really suck if neither dean ambrose nor seth rollins or ziggler or drew uh were booked for the pay-per-view so i expect some sort of a tag team match there um as far as what they're going to do in the main event of hell in the cell i still am guessing that roman is going to find a way to retain here i don't know if you take the belt off of him that quick i'm a little bit disappointed in the braun Strowman heel turn as well um i don't mind him being a heel a lot of people are pissed that it doesn't make sense and blah 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 fuck off i think it makes perfect sense for a guy that big that bad to be a heel really nothing wrong with that but if i had my choice i would prefer him as a baby face because i like braun Strowman and he's fucking hilarious and he's kind of lovably scary at the same time so there was a lot about the baby face presentation of braun Strowman that i liked but there's also a lot of his heel persona that i like i don't think i don't really like him feeling the need to team up with guys i know the shield is the most dominant faction in WWE history according to them but Braun Strowman has always seemed to me to be like the guy that doesn't give a shit he shouldn't care if Roman Reigns has 20 friends he'll take on all 20 of those bastards by himself so now why all of a sudden he needs backup I don't know but hey it is what it is and as long as the feud is good and it keeps rolling and Strowman is not just fed to Roman in the cell or whatever I'm okay with it as long as they can build on it move forward from it even if Braun Strowman loses it might not be the end of it and uh, there is also the possibility that Braun Strowman could win Uh, like I said earlier I I find it hard to believe that Roman's going to beat Brock at the second biggest pay-per-view of the year and then drop the belt 30 days later I don't really see that happening but uh, if Roman does drop the belt Strowman could wind up winning it and then his faction's got all the belts so who knows but right now my early prediction and I'll have predictions up next week by the way uh, but right now I'm predicting Roman Reigns somehow to walk out of that match uh, as champion now as far as all of the heels that emptied out of the locker room to attack the shield in the final segment of Monday Night Raw there was one guy leading the charge there was one guy that came out there first and threw the first punch and that was none other than Kevin Owens oh my god are you fucking kidding me WWE one week one fucking week and they bring Kevin Owens back and they don't bring him back in a great way they don't bring him back in a surprising way or a swerve or anything like that he interrupts get this a meditation session yes a meditation fucking session with Jinder Mahal and Bobby Lashley Bobby Lashley is repeatedly put in the stupidest fucking situations first with uh, the the people that imitated his sisters then with the obstacle course then being a horrible singer with Elias now he's sitting down on a fucking rug wearing a scarf and meditating what the fuck is going on here I'm, I'm blown away it was so stupid and the last thing that this segment needed was Kevin Owens You just think it's going to be something between Lashley and Jinder. They're in there, you know, meditating like a couple of fucking idiots. And then out of nowhere, Kevin Owens comes through the crowd, hits the ring, and starts attacking Bobby Lashley. Why? Why would you attack Bobby Lashley? You were already destroyed by one guy bigger than you this summer in Braun Strowman. Now you're going to go provoke Bobby Lashley? I mean, Jesus Christ, is this guy fucking mental? So I don't know what the purpose of this was. I don't know why he's attacking Lashley, why this is the spot that he's picking to come back. I thought they would keep Kevin Owens off of TV for a few weeks and try to bring him back as a world title contender or something like that after this current feud runs its course and Roman Reigns is now into the near the end of the year as champion or something like that. That's when I wanted to see Kevin Owens come back or at least hold him off for a few weeks. I know WWE can't just have him sit at home for three months or anything like that, but I mentioned this in my last episode that my biggest concern with this Kevin Owens quitting angle is that it's going to be ruined and they're going to bring him back just like they did Dolph Ziggler a few months ago last year, whenever the hell that was, when he quit and then he just kind of randomly showed back up at the Royal Rumble. 
And you're like, that's how they brought him back, really? But even that was better than what they did with Kevin Owens. Now, I'm sure the story here is, is he's going to have something, he's going to have some sort of an alliance with uh, Baron Corbin. Uh, Baron Corbin, I'm sure it will be revealed, was instrumental in bringing Kevin Owens back, and all of that is fine. But why did it only take one week? Why didn't they stretch this out? Because really, when you look at what Kevin Owens did on Raw, was any of that shit, the previous week when he quit, was any of that necessary? That didn't set up any sort of an angle. He could have just lost that match to Seth Rollins and gone back to the locker room and still attacked Bobby Lashley this week, seemingly setting up a program between the two of them. He could have still led the charge of the heels, attacking the Shield. He could have done all of that without even having to quit last week on Raw. So the whole segment last week seemed fucking pointless. So I'm sure, like I said, more will be revealed on TV next week as to why Kevin Owens returned and what his deal is and what sort of a alliance he's made with Baron Corbin. Maybe Baron Corbin said, hey, if you come back, I will guarantee you a title shot in the future or some shit like that. I don't know, but whatever it is, it sucked. And I don't see the point of Kevin Owens coming back this fast. I don't see the point of him attacking Lashley. Why is he provoking Lashley? What is in it? for Kevin Owens to attack Bobby Lashley. Lashley's not a champion. If Kevin Owens is going to come back and attack anybody, you would think it would be Roman or Seth or somebody with a fucking title belt. Why Bobby Lashley? Makes no sense. Uh, So I guess maybe it'll make more sense next week, but at least right now it makes absolutely none whatsoever. Uh, We also have some big news involving the Authors of Pain. The Authors of Pain have kind of been directionless lately. Uh, Ever since they came onto the main roster and uh, dumped Paul Ellering, they haven't done jack shit. Uh, They've had some squash matches. They're still being built as monsters and everything, but they're not even the title hunt right now. You know, you got the B team out there dancing and having sex with announce tables as tag team champions, and you have these monsters just sitting there on the roster not doing a goddamn thing. And a lot of people said that they need a manager. They should have never gotten rid of Paul Ellering. And it really took away from the whole presentation of the Authors of Pain. And they really haven't even done anything. As a matter of fact, I think they even lost a six-man match on Raw a couple of weeks ago, didn't they? So they've kind of really been floundering. So out of nowhere, (laughs) on Monday Night Raw, like literally out of the blue, nobody saw this coming. There was no teases for this. And when you think of all the people that you could stick with the Authors of Pain in a managerial role... Probably one of the last guys on my mind that I ever would have thought of was Drake Maverick. He comes out there with the Authors of Pain, dressed in the full riot gear, you know, which is a stark contrast from the way he looks on 205 Live. He's always very colorful and very sparkly and all that shit. Here he's like Mr. Riot Gear Badass. He almost looked good and ridiculous at the same time wearing that getup. Uh, But he announced when they came out to the ring that he is now the manager of the Authors of Pain. They beat the shit out of a couple of jobbers, I think. And Drake Maverick said, I'm the manager of 205 Live, or I'm the general manager of 205 Live, but I'm also the manager of the Authors of Pain, the new manager. So this is good for them, I think. And it's probably WWE's way of making more use of Drake Maverick. I mean, they're paying this guy really to only do backstage segments and in-ring interviews on 205 Live. That's it. He doesn't have a presence on NXT or SmackDown or Raw, so they might as well get a little bit more money's worth out of the guy and uh, book him as a manager for somebody. So he's pulling double duty now. He's going to manage a tag team on the main roster, but he's going to be the GM of the 205 Live brand. So it's kind of strange, but at the same time, it's not something I'm going to complain about. I'm willing to try anybody. I'm willing to put anybody with the Authors of Pain in a managerial role. Uh, Drake Maverick has been impressive. I've liked him a lot on 205 Live. Like I said, he's going going in a completely different direction here with this persona with the Authors of Pain, but I'm willing to give it a chance, and I'm curious where it's going to lead. And now that he's in charge of the Authors of Pain, you would think the title shots will be uh, something in their immediate future. At least, let's hope. And finally, before I stop talking about Raw and move on to SmackDown, I do want to mention the Bellas. Nikki and Brie Bella returned to Monday Night Raw. They took on the Riot Squad in a tag team match. And let me just say, Brie Bella looks like shit. How bad of a wrestler do you have to be when somebody like Nikki Bella is 10 times better than you in the ring? Um, I've never been a fan of Brie Bella, uh, in the, especially in the ring. I hate Brie Mode. I hate her yelling Brie Mode more than anything Roman Reigns will ever say or ever do. A hundred times more. It's so annoying. And she's not good. She's not good in the ring. She's never been good in the ring. And she had a couple of horrible botches. A couple of the worst looking botches I've ever seen. She failed miserably twice at doing a suicide dive on the outside of the ring. Now, the first time she did it, some fans are 
passing blame on to Sarah Logan. And when you go back and look at the replay of Brie Bella kind of running to make the dive, but then stopping and then tripping over herself and falling through the ropes, it does appear that Sarah Logan is a bit out of position. But still, it doesn't matter if she's out of position. You've got to make the adjustments as a wrestler. You can't just stumble out of the ring like a fucking blind monkey. Sarah Logan could have been in a better position, but Brie could have done a better job of thinking on her feet. And then she went for another one on the other side of the ring later on, and she fell nearly right on her head and damn near killed herself. So Brie, just stay the fuck out of the ring. It amazes me that she has a pay-per-view match, pay-per-view match, coming up next month with uh, her husband taking on The Miz and Maurice. And why the hell is she on both shows? You know, I mean, she's got a she's got a pay-per-view match booked on the SmackDown brand in a couple of weeks, but yet she's wrestling a tag team match on Raw. I don't understand. Uh, the brand split is really going to be fizzled out here, I think. By the time SmackDown hits Fox, I don't even think this shit's going to exist anymore. But the Bellas were really heavily hyped. They were advertised all week long. The return to the ring for the first time in three years or whatever it was, wrestling together. And uh, when you look at the match, it was just pure garbage. And Nikki Bella was a hell of a lot better than Brie. When Nikki got in there, she was turning it up a little bit. She was doing her moves. She was fast. She was crisp. I was actually happy with the work of Nikki Bella, probably because I'm comparing it to her sister, um, but uh, it wasn't half bad, and she looked a hell of a lot better and a hell of a lot more polished than Brie. Now, granted, Brie's been doing the reality show. She just had a baby. It's not like Brie is at the Performance Center working every week, so I'm willing to cut Brie herself some slack, but I'm not willing to cut WWE any slack for putting her ass in the ring. She doesn't know what she's doing. And it's becoming more and more obvious with each passing week on TV that the Bellas are going to have something to do with Ronda Rousey in the future. Now, I also said that about Natalia. From the minute Natalia got on the main roster after WrestleMania, I said Natalia's going to turn heel. And so far, I've turned out to be wrong. So the Bellas seem very likely because WWE is really going out of their way to make sure the fans know that there's some sort of a friendship between the Bellas and Rousey and the Bellas really love her and they're supporting her and they root for her and shit like that, you know that's going to turn around to bite Rousey at some point and you already have a built-in angle for when Ronda Rousey drops that belt. You know, you know 100% that when Ronda Rousey does drop that Raw Women's title, Stephanie McMahon will be involved. Ronda Rousey has completely destroyed Stephanie McMahon on two or three different occasions, so you know uh, that she's going to wind up getting some revenge at some point against against Ronda Rousey, and that's going to be how you take the belt off of Rousey. Now, you might do some sort of a heel turn. There's been a lot of speculation about Ronda Rousey and Nikki Bella. Goddamn. Main eventing evolution. Now, I really don't want to see that happen, but if it does, I would assume that you're going to do some sort of a heel turn between now and then, and the match in Australia might be a good place for that because I believe Ronda Rousey is teaming up with the Bellas to take on fucking somebody. So that seems like a really good spot for a Nikki Bella heel turn if you wind up doing that. Or Ronda Rousey might have a title match against somebody else at Evolution and Nikki Bella interferes, costing Ronda the match, and that leads to a Ronda and Nikki feud after the fact. So not really sure where they're going there yet, but you know something between Nikki Bella and Ronda Rousey is definitely on the horizon. So that's really all I'm going to mention as far as uh, Monday Night Raw goes. We had some other shit take place as well, but it really overall wasn't that good of a show. Those were pretty much... Uh, only uh, the only things we're talking about. Uh, moving on to SmackDown Live, there wasn't a whole lot going on on this show either, but I really enjoyed the long-running show arc with Daniel Bryan and Brie Bella and R-Truth and The Miz and Maurice. All this shit was great. Uh, SmackDown Live opens up with a Daniel Bryan and Brie Bella promo uh, with Renee Young in the ring. Uh, the Miz and Maurice uh, wind up, uh, they show some footage up on the Tron. Uh, from earlier on in the day, Miz and Maurice were in the building all by themselves. Earlier on in the day, there was nobody there. They were in the ring cutting a promo on Daniel Bryan and Brie Bella and calling them out to the ring inside of an empty arena when no one was around. The Miz and Maurice are also talking on the Tron from backstage before they showed that footage. And they said, hey, we've already been at SmackDown. We came there looking for you guys and you were nowhere to be found. We called you out to the ring and you were too scared to come out. So we're not in the building. We're taking the night off. We're going to go have dinner. And they named the name of the restaurant in Detroit. They're going to go uh, have some dinner, some Italian restaurant or whatever. And in the ring with Daniel Bryan and Brie Bella, Andrade Cien Almas and Zelina Vega wind up coming out. That whole thing, that promo leads to a match, a really good match, I might add, between Daniel Bryan and Cien Almas with Daniel Bryan getting the victory. He hit him with the uh, running knee and pinned him. Pretty damn good little match between the two of them. That's twice now we've seen them work together. And after the match, it was really funny. They go to commercial and they come back and Daniel Bryan 
Bryan and Brie Bella are leaving. They've got their luggage and they're leaving. Daniel Bryan is still in his ring gear and dressed like a can of Sprite, as somebody said in my chat a couple of weeks ago. And uh, they're leaving and they tell, uh, I forgot who was interviewing them, but they tell them that they're going to go find the Miz and Maurice. They said the name of the restaurant they're going to, so Daniel Bryan and Brie Bella are going to go have dinner there and confront them at the restaurant. Uh, We then come back later on in the night to find the Miz and Maurice back in the building. They're now there. They must have seen what Daniel Bryan and Brie Bella were doing, so they hauled ass back to the arena, and now they're saying they want to confront them again when Daniel Bryan and Brie Bella aren't there and trying to call them out. That whole thing was pretty funny. And then it takes an even different turn and a different twist when R-Truth starts getting involved. Now, R-Truth has been doing the thing for the past couple of weeks on TV where he wants a match with Carmella. I don't know why. And so he's been going around looking for her every week. So uh, he stumbles across uh, Maurice, who's got her back turned, and he's like, Carmella, Carmella, I want to match with you or whatever. And she turns around and she goes, I'm not Carmella. And R-Truth doesn't get it. He still thinks she's Carmella. And then the Miz shows up and he says, why are you talking to my wife? Throws a few insults at R-Truth and cuts him down a little bit. And then R-Truth just looks at him and says, I don't know what Carmella sees in you and walks away. Got a huge laugh out of the crowd. I'm laughing my ass off. I fucking love R-Truth. He cracks me up. He is 46 years old. Can you believe that? And uh, still looks like a million bucks. Um, so then later on, uh, Truth is walking around backstage with Ty Dillinger for some reason. And then he runs into the real Carmella. And uh, he asks her to come to the ring with him. He asks, will you accompany me to the ring later on in my main event match with The Miz? Because I need somebody to even the odds because the other Carmella is going to be out there. So poor R-Truth is so fucking confused. He thinks there's two Carmellas. He wants to face one Carmella in a match, but now he wants to have or have a truce with her and have her accompany him to the ring. And as a matter of fact, I believe they're even mixed match challenge partners as well. So our truth cannot decide if he loves or hates Carmella. And it might be an interesting alliance on TV. I think the two of them are pretty fucking funny. Poor Ty Dillinger is an innocent bystander in all this. He's sitting there confused as hell, doesn't know what the hell's going on in R-Truth's head. And then at the end of the segment, after Carmella agrees to accompany Truth to the ring, uh, Dillinger is like, what the hell are you doing? And R-Truth kind of hints to Dillinger that... He knows what he's been doing the whole time. This whole thing might be an act. And he goes, hey, I'm trying to teach you a lesson, young fella. I just taught you how to get in the main event of SmackDown. Our truth a guy that hasn't been relevant, as The Miz said, since 2011 or 12, when the two of them were a team. Remember that? Remember when they were the badass team and they faced The Rock and John Cena at Survivor Series? That's a long time ago. So um, it's been a while since we've seen R-Truth really do anything of significance on TV. So the fact that he's in the main event of SmackDown, I got a big kick out of. So you fast forward now to the main event and you have R-Truth taking on The Miz. And in the middle of the match, Daniel Bryan's music starts playing because I guess him and Brie Bella have returned from the restaurant when they found out Miz and Maurice weren't there. And that was just enough to distract The Miz and allow R-Truth to roll him up and pin him and get the victory. So R-Truth defeats The Miz in the main event of SmackDown. I fucking love that. Um, so I don't I don't know what... A lot of people have asked me my opinion about what they're doing with R-Truth. I really don't have any problem with it. I don't know why anybody would. R-Truth is finally doing something of significance. Even The Miz made mention in his confrontation with him backstage that he wasn't even aware that R-Truth still worked there. And I am honestly am not aware that R-Truth still worked there unless I see him on TV. He's kind of a guy that you forget about. So to see our truth you know, be back in a main event picture, it, maybe it's his final little hurrah. I mean, how long is R-Truth really going to be doing things in the ring? He's 46 years old. He still looks awesome. He looks in great shape. He looks like he's 26 years old. Ron Killings is a veteran. How much longer is he going to be in the ring doing things? So the fact that he was on SmackDown tonight or SmackDown on Tuesday, he main evented, he faced The Miz, and he won Hey, I got no complaints. And plus, you know, if people are upset that they're making our truth look stupid, he hinted to Ty Dillinger that he might be pulling a Brian Pillman. Maybe he's just working everybody. He's going to make everybody think that he's crazy, but really, he's about as sane as you can get. So that could be possibly where they're going there with our truth but at least for right now, it might not lead anywhere. Our truth might be back to doing nothing next week, but at least for one night only, it was nice to see our truth be a big part of the show, be an entertaining part of the show, and get a victory in the main event. You're going to get no complaints whatsoever out of good mic work for the way that was handled, and that was really... The best thing about SmackDown, that whole thing, it was, what, three or four segments long? The whole build between Daniel Bryan and Bree and The Miz and Maurice, and then you throw R-Truth in the middle. I thought the whole thing was pretty fun. It was a fun episode of SmackDown this week. It wasn't a great episode, and it wasn't a, a earth-shattering or groundbreaking episode or anything like that. It was just fun, and I enjoyed that. And it's nice to see 
fun episode sometimes because uh, those of you who join me on Monday nights, we know that Raw sometimes is not so fun. Uh, aside from that, on SmackDown, the, other, the only other big angles that we saw uh, was the big AJ Styles and Samoa Joe brawl. Joe was in the ring cutting a promo. AJ Styles then appeared on the Tron. It looked like AJ was not in the building, and he starts talking to uh, Samoa Joe, and then his music hits. He runs to the ring. They start fighting, and uh, he gets the better of Joe, runs him off. He nearly takes his head off with a chair. Paige is out there, too, to try to help break this thing up and save her Hell in the Cell title match. So that feud is going pretty well. I, I I've said this before that I like the AJ Styles and Samoa Joe feud so far a hell of a lot better than AJ Styles and Shinsuke Nakamura, uh, primarily because Joe can cut promos and it can get personal with Nakamura and AJ with the limitations of Nakamura on the mic. You couldn't do a whole lot there to really make it personal. I think that's why they brought all of those nut shots into play and made that such a big focal point of the feud because you couldn't do a whole lot on the mic where this is a lot of stuff on the mic and they're bringing personal shit into this. AJ's family is involved, his wife, and Samoa Joe is just really displaying what an evil son of a bitch he can be and I love heel Samoa Joe. We also had Rusev Day defeating Sanity and the Usos in a triple threat. Now, last week, they had another triple threat that the Bar won, and they were going to face the winner of this match next week, and the winner of that will get a title shot against the New Day at Hell in the Cell. So next week on SmackDown, it will be Rusev and Aiden English uh, taking on Cesaro and Sheamus. Now, I would assume if they're going to do a breakup here with English and Rusev, it's either going to be done next week or it's going to be done at Hell in the Cell. So maybe Rusev Day beats the bar next week they go into hell in the cell to face the new day and they lose and that leads to the breakup and the split and the implosion uh, of rusev day that's possible so don't really know where they're going to go there yet and don't really care i'm not a big fan of these little miniature tournaments to determine a number one contender those are fine sometimes but it seems like the way wwe always determines tag team title contenders and i hate it there's never a storyline there's never an issue between two teams back in the day the Hearts and the Bulldogs didn't wrestle for the title because Bret Hart and Jim Neidhart won two triple threat matches. They wrestled because there was a personal fucking issue between the two teams. And I just wish that it was like that now, and it's not, and it sucks. So don't really care what the future is of the SmackDown tag team titles right now. Don't care if the New Day retains them. Don't care if the New Day drops them. Um, we're going to get into the Hell in the Cell card here in a minute. The last thing I'm going to mention about SmackDown is uh, Charlotte and Becky. We are into our third week here of the Becky Lynch heel turn. And uh, this week on SmackDown, they just did an in-studio interview between the two. I think maybe Renee Young moderated it. I can't remember. Maybe nobody did. Uh, but you had Charlotte on one side, Becky on the other. And they cut and they said some words about each other. Nothing really great there. Um, but Becky is not doing a horrible job job being a heel. A lot of people have been livid ever since this happened because Becky Lynch shouldn't be a heel. Makes no sense. The fans want to cheer her, blah, blah, blah. And I made the argument last week that I think a lot of fans just like to hear themselves say that and they don't really understand or analyze things and look at things objectively because I swear to you, if Becky Lynch would have still turned heel at SummerSlam but she would have won the title, I don't think you would have nearly as many fans complaining. You'd still have some but not nearly as many fans would be bitching if Becky had the title. I think what bothered them the most at the end of the day is the fact that Becky lost and Charlotte won. And now Charlotte is starting to adopt that Roman Reigns persona where WWE always wants to put her over and always wants to shove her down everybody's throat. And now Charlotte, somebody who's a much better heel and performs much better as a heel than a babyface, is a babyface that's being forced down everybody's throat. And the girl that everybody wants to cheer is a heel. But I don't really mind it. I don't care. I think if a babyface Becky would have won the title at SummerSlam, it would have been a great moment. She would have got a great pop. She would have had a wonderful celebration the following Tuesday on SmackDown. But after that, it would slowly fizzle and Becky would turn into being the same type of champion she was when she was the inaugural SmackDown Women's Champion, which isn't bad. But at the same time, was she really was the roof blowing off when her music hit and she came out there? Or was she setting the world on fire? Was Becky the greatest babyface champion ever hold the belt? Fuck no. So to me, this is something, this is a new direction for her. This is something that she can have fun with, sink her teeth into, and uh, try to go in a different direction, you know, and, and take her character in, in a completely opposite direction of what she's used to. And I think so far, she's not doing a bad job. A lot of people have compared her to Stone Cold Steve Austin. And here's another comparison to Stone Cold Steve Austin. Remember when Austin was getting over as a babyface? He was still a heel. 
Back in 1997, you never heard some asshole fan. We didn't have YouTube, but if we did, there wouldn't be a fan coming up on YouTube saying, man, this is bullshit. What's wrong with WWE? Austin shouldn't be a heel. It doesn't make any sense. The fans love him. Remember how much the fans loved Austin? He didn't give a shit. Every time they would chant his name, he would get on the mic and say, shut up. I don't need your support. I don't want your support. You can cheer all you want. Every single one of you can go piss up a rope. And I love that about him. I love that he didn't give a shit what the fans wanted. And the fans weren't pissed. Nobody was criticizing WWE for their ass backwards booking. This Austin heel turn or Austin being a heel doesn't make sense. He should be a babyface. He's the most over guy in the company and the fans are cheering their asses off for him. But yet he's cheating in every match. He's running away like a coward. He's telling off the fans. He's feuding with all the other top baby faces. What the fuck is going on here? But no, nobody was saying that because they liked it. So what's wrong with Becky doing the same thing here? I got, I have no issue with that. So I think uh, at Hell in the Cell, Becky Lynch, she could win the belt. I also think that they could prolong this and it could happen at Evolution or after Evolution. And I have a feeling that WWE might want Charlotte as the champion heading into Evolution. So I don't know how confident I am that Becky actually beats Charlotte and wins the belt. Um, but if she doesn't, I just hope that it uh, it continues and the feud continues. Because don't forget, when Austin was a bubbling star, when he was that heel that everybody loved, he wasn't winning his matches either. He lost a couple. Of, he lost to Bret Hart at Survivor Series. He lost to Bret Hart at WrestleMania 13. The fans weren't bitching that Bret was being shoved down her throat. Throats. The fans weren't complaining that Austin's being fed to Bret Hart or buried, but that's what they're going to say about Becky. They're going to, if Charlotte beats Becky, they're going to say that Becky was fed to Charlotte because it's a word that they hear in the wrestling community a lot, and they like to repeat it without analyzing what it actually fucking means. And I promise you, if Charlotte does retain the title, Becky is not fed to her. Becky is not buried. It's called fucking wrestling. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. If you think Becky Lynch is going to go the rest of her career without ever being women's champion again, you are out of your fucking mind. Uh, so that is pretty much all I'm going to mention on the SmackDown side of things. It was also announced this week on uh, WWE social media, and they talked about it on SmackDown, is that the Mixed Match Challenge is returning. Now, has it already been a year? To me, this seems like something a little bit more recent. I don't remember when they did this, so maybe they're not doing it annually. Uh, maybe Maybe they're doing it every few months. But anyway, season two of the Mixed Match Challenge is coming up in a couple of weeks. I believe that is going to air again on Facebook. Last time around, I didn't really watch a lot of it. I watched a little, but not much. And I don't think this year will be any different. But they did announce all of the teams. And they're pretty good looking teams. We have uh, Sasha Banks and Bobby Lashley. I like that team. We have Finn Balor and Bailey. We have Alexa Bliss and Braun Strowman. That is a repeat of last year. Maybe Balor and Bailey is too. I know Alexa and Strowman team last year, so they're back together. Uh, we we have Natalia and Kevin Owens. We've got Alicia Fox and Jinder Mahal. Like I said earlier, we've got Carmella and our truth We've got Asuka and The Miz back together again. They, of course, were last year's winners. And uh, probably my favorite team is Charlotte and AJ Styles. Holy shit, is that some talent there. Uh, I like the Robe Warriors last year with Charlotte and Rude, but I think I like Charlotte and Styles even better because they're both world champs. We also have Lana and Rusev, and we also have Naomi and Jimmy Uso. Now, last year they did have some injury issues. We did have some replacements, I believe. Hopefully, everything goes off without a hitch this year, and it's a good little tournament, so I will at least keep my eye on it, but I'm probably not going to watch the whole thing. And finally, before I get out of here, let's just run through right now the proposed and probable Hell in the Cell card. So the matches that they have announced so far on WWE.com or of course, Roman Reigns versus Braun Strowman for the Universal title inside of the Hell in the Cell. We've got AJ Styles versus Samoa Joe. We've got Becky Lynch versus Charlotte. We've got Alexa Bliss versus Ronda Rousey. We have Randy Orton versus Jeff Hardy also inside a Hell in the Cell. We've got the mixed tag with Miz and Maurice taking on Daniel Bryan and Brie Bella. And we have the New Day taking on whoever wins the match between Rusev Day and The Bar next week on SmackDown. Aside from that, those are the only matches we have announced. So that's a total of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm guessing we might get Bobby Lashley versus Kevin Owens. Probably right. Uh, we could get another Baron Corbin versus Finn Balor match. And I mentioned earlier when I talked about Raw, the tag team titles might be on the line if Dolph and Drew either get a rematch against the B team or if they take on Seth Rollins and Dean Ambrose for the title, which I think is a more likely match there. So that is about 10 matches most likely that we're going to have for Hell in the Cell. And uh, they'll probably uh, start announcing these or finish announcing these, I should say, uh, by next week, because next week is the go-home Raw and SmackDown shows for this 
this pay-per-view. So it doesn't look like a horrible card. I mean, I think the show can be good. I'm really looking forward to the AJ and Joe match, uh, considering all the heat there. I think both Hell in the Cell matches have potential. And I think overall, on paper, this card doesn't look half bad. And I will say this, too, about Hell in the Cell. I really like the graphics this year. I like all of the um, promo graphics and the logo and everything that they're doing for Hell in the Cell. I think it looks really good with the skull and all of that. So um, normally, I don't even care or pay attention to that sort of shit, but... It just seems to be especially good this time around for Hell in the Cell. So let me know what you guys think about that. I have got to get out of here and finish up my week. I will uh, talk to you guys possibly earlier in the weekend if I throw some mic drops or come up with a one-off episode or something like that. But expect to hear from me again this coming Monday for my live Raw Watch Along. And then the next day on Tuesday the 11th, you got a brand new special episode coming to the channel. I will catch you guys in just a couple of days. Have a great rest of your week and weekend. And I'll talk to you real soon. Until then, peace. 